Bible Church. We're thankful to have you with us today. Let me share with you four quick announcements, please. First is this, foster care training after church today at the Beacon. Secondly, baptism is going to be on May 1st if you're interested in being baptized. Uh, please don't get me your testimony like one day before. Uh, go ahead and send that if you're interested in being baptized. Uh, you would also need to desire to be a member of Grace Bible Church if you want to be baptized on May the 1st. Also, Wednesday, 6.30, we're going to be covering Chapter 3 of the Brown Chapel book, Praying Backwards, and talking about the discussion questions that go with that chapter, which are in the back of the book itself. Also, if you uh, do not want to be baptized and have already had a believer's baptism, but still desire membership uh, at Grace Bible Church, you too would need to get a testimony to me. Uh, you would need to get on our website, gracebible.online, and check out the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith and say, do, do I believe these things? And you would also need to be willing to sign the church covenant. All right, I'm going to let Trent come and read a call to worship. Morning. 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 We're going to ask you to read from Psalm 116, verses 1 through 7. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, and because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pain of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The word preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. Lord, I pray for, I thank you for your abundant grace and mercy towards us. Father, I pray for your the service today. I pray that it would be honoring to you and that it would, it would, you would get all the glory out of it. And Lord, I pray for Brent and I pray you would give him supernatural strength by your grace to be able to preach your word and all of us listening i pray we would look to christ jesus and his name for amen amen <coughs> all right let's stay in this thing
of salvation by your grace alone. And God, thank you for that and that unspeakable gift that you bore for us and you've made the way for us. Lord, you've changed our hearts in a way that we can't understand and we can believe this. And God, just help us to honor you for that in our lives. Help us to honor you at this time and through this day's service, God, just bless Brent as he comes before us to share your word. Lord, just help your word to change our hearts and help us, Lord, to know and to come to a deeper realization of his gift and what you've done for us. And God, we just praise you. Amen. Let's stand and sing again.
last song we're going to sing is Christ the True and Better Adam. We tried this once about a month ago, and we're going to give it a whirl again. Great, great work.
Let's pray. Now, Father, we thank you for letting us be here today. Uh, we're just thankful that we have a hope in the future because Jesus is enough. He is more than enough. Thank you for his perfect life, which is our righteousness. Thank you for his atoning death, which has borne away all the guilt of our sin. We pray, Lord, that your gospel would be manifest and clear to us all today. We pray that those of us who have received and believed that gospel of Christ crucified for sinners would believe it even more by the time we're done with this text. And Lord, there are always people joining us uh, each week who have a head knowledge of these things and have never been born again and have never come to a place of utter despair over their own sin. And we ask today, Jesus, that you would save many of these people. We ask, Lord, that uh, your spirit would give a heart of flesh to those with a heart of stone, even as I preach. And we're thankful that you're able to do that and that nothing is too hard for you. Uh, Lord, we confess and readily admit that no amount of truth will do any of us one iota of good apart from the work of your spirit. Uh, all is vain unless your spirit comes and makes these words live to us. I ask, Lord, for these dear people that you brought to listen today, that you will give them ears to hear. We pray, Lord, that you give us an ability to pay attention, that our minds would not drift, and that you would use these words to generate faith in our hearts. Be with me as I preach, Lord. Uh, help me not to say anything that would bring reproach to your name. Uh, please give me a heart and mind set on pleasing you and help me to know you in the act of preaching. We praise you that you're the God of all grace, and we pray that the grace that Jesus has won for us uh, would be sent our way in great measure this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we got done with the book of 1 Peter last week, and Easter's coming up in a couple weeks, so we're in this middle kind of floating around place. And so I thought we would uh, focus on some of the basic uh, fundamentals of the Christian faith because you can never know the fundamental truths too well. And one such fundamental truth is salvation through Christ alone. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. And we're going to speak about this topic of salvation through Christ alone from Matthew 19. We're going to pick up in verse 13 and we're going to read down through Verse 22, Matthew 19, 13. Verse 13 says this, Then children were brought to him, him being Jesus, of course. Children were brought to Jesus, that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people. But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. So, um, yes. <laughs> the instruments are now playing themselves. <laughs> themselves. Uh, but those, those two verses, or rather three verses, uh, 13 through 15, we'll get back to those toward the end of the sermon. They actually do have a purpose. Uh, but in the former part of the sermon, we're going to deal with these next verses, verse 16 through 22. And behold, a man came up to him. The, the Greek text actually says someone came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come. Follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. In 2005, a professor of sociology at the University of 
Notre Dame named Christian Smith uh, wrote a book entitled Soul Searching, The Spirituality of America's Teens. And so in order to compile the data to write this book, he did interviews with over 3,000 teenagers uh, in 2005. So those of you who are in your 30s, you were these teenagers in, in 2005. And he also uh, interviewed many parents and asked the teenagers about what their parents believed, what the teenagers believed with regard to spiritual things. And interestingly, uh, Christian Smith's survey revealed that teenagers who had grown up in church had the same basic set of spiritual beliefs as teenagers who had not grown up in church, okay? Uh, seems like all the teenagers he surveyed had this basic set of spiritual beliefs that uh, were, were held by pop culture at large. And he distilled these basic spiritual beliefs down to four. This is what his research found. Here's what he found. Four main spiritual beliefs. One, God exists. Two, God wants people to be good. Three, God wants people to be happy. And fourth, and most importantly for our purposes this morning, good people go to heaven when they die. And as you hear those four spiritual beliefs that Mr. Smith diluted from all his interviews, you will know that things haven't changed much. This is basically what people believe in our culture, even those who identify as Christians. Now, if it's true that God exists and he wants people to be good and nice and fair, if it is true that good people go to heaven, and of course, any of you who have lived in this area for any amount of time and went to more than one funeral know that that's what the Baptist preachers believe here too. <laughs> Uh, we will miss old Joe Bob, but he's a good person, so he's in heaven now. Anyway, I didn't mean to say that. But, um, yes, if it's true that good people go to heaven, how good do you have to be to get there? Is God taking the top 50%? What if it's just the top 25? What if it's just the top 1%? You know, it keeps getting to be worse and worse news all the time. So the question you want to ask an answer from this text is very simple. What kind of person makes it to heaven? What kind of person makes it to heaven? And I just have two points. The first is this. Good, I put it in scare quotes, good people cannot make it to heaven. Good people cannot make it to heaven. Look at verse 16 and 17. And behold, a man, someone, came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. So in verse 16, someone comes up to Jesus. We learn later on that it's a man. But uh, as I said, the Greek text says, someone comes up to Jesus and wants to know how good he needs to be to make it to heaven. Obviously, he is a spiritual person. You know, everybody's a spiritual person these days. Evidently, that was a thing back then, too. He, he believes in an afterlife. And evidently, he believes that good people make it to heaven. Evidently, he believes much the same thing that the, the teenagers that Christian Smith interviewed in 05 believe. So he comes to Jesus for some advice on how to make himself a better person. He comes to Jesus in the same way that someone might go to Dr. Phil or Oprah Winfrey or the Dalai Lama for some spiritual pointers about how to polish up their life and make it a better life. You see, you see in verse 16 how he refers to Jesus? He says, teacher, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? So this man comes to Jesus as a teacher, but the point I'm trying to make is he doesn't come to Jesus looking for a Savior. He comes to Jesus looking for someone to show him, to teach him how to save his own self. Immediately, Jesus replies with a probing question. Look at verse 17. Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. And so why does, why does Jesus ask this question? Uh, why are you asking me about what is good? There's only one who is good. He's trying to get this man to think about his view of goodness. So uh, the word good is always a relative term, is it not? I am a really good basketball player compared to my five-year-old daughter, Charlie, but not so much compared to LeBron James. 
And I am an excellent mechanic compared to my wife. But not so much compared to a full-time diesel service technician. And I, I am a very good person compared to meth addicts and murderers and scam artists and human traffickers, but not so much compared to the sinless Son of God. Not so much compared to a God of infinite holiness. There is only one, Jesus says, who is good. Look at the end of verse 17, where Jesus answers this man's question. He, he came to Jesus, what good thing must I do to have eternal life? Jesus says, okay, pal, you're obviously not getting what I just said about there's only one who is good. Now, here's the answer to your question. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. And with great confidence in his own ability, this young man says, which ones? And that's really a pretty good question because in the first five books of the Bible alone, there are over 613 commandments. <laughs> so he wants to know which ones. Uh, obviously, the answer should be all of them. But Jesus answers this man's second question by taking him to the second table of the Ten Commandments. So those of you who know the Ten Commandments know that uh, it doesn't d divide equally in half, but there's basically two halves to the Ten Commandments. The first four are man's responsibility toward God, and the last six are man's responsibility to his neighbor. And so Jesus takes this man to the second table of God's law and tells him, keep these commandments about how you should treat your neighbor. In verses 18 and 19, he lists five of the six commandments from this second table of the law. Do you see this in verse 18 and 19? You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So uh, you shall love your neighbor as yourself is not one of the Ten Commandments. It's just basically a summary of that second table of the law. This is how you love your neighbor as yourself, by doing these things. So there are six of those commandments about how we love our neighbor. Je Jesus mentions five of them to this man. He says, do these things if you want to have eternal life. And at this point, the young man's count, uh, countenance must have brightened. He must have stood a bit taller. His chest might have gone out a little bit. And what did he say? All these I have kept. All these I have kept. And, and the verb there for keep is, is the Greek verb for guard. Like a... Like a a sentry would guard a prisoner, uh, like a prison keeper, keeper would guard his inmates. What he's saying is, I have wholeheartedly kept them. I have kept these commandments, Jesus, that you just mentioned flawlessly. Now, this is the first time uh, in the narrative that, that this someone, in verse 16, who comes up to Jesus is called a young man, okay? Okay. But in verse 20, he is described as a young man. Do you see that? The young man said to him, all these I have kept, what do I still lack? So he's gone from being someone who comes up to Jesus to being a young man asking what he still lacks. And we find out a bit later uh, that he's also rich. Do you see that at the end of verse 22? It says he went away sorrowful for he had what? He had great possessions. So at the beginning of this account, someone, a man, comes up to Jesus. Now we find that he is a, uh, not just a someone, but a young man. Later on, we find out that he is wealthy. He is a rich, young man. So the point I'm trying to make is this. In Jesus' day, nobody would have had more privilege, more status, more advantages than who? A rich, young male. And the point I'm trying to make is that this man to whom Jesus is talking is the quintessential embodiment of self-sufficiency. He has it all. He has probably been voted most likely in his class to succeed. Uh, he has the world by the tail. He is a real all-American, so to speak. And in verse 20, uh, this young man's claim to have kept all the commandments shows that he has this strong belief in his own ability, in his own self-sufficiency, in his own righteousness. Not only does he have wealth and youth and a privileged position as a male, but he believes that he is the man when it comes to spiritual things as well. 
Now, he's much like the Apostle Paul before God saved him. In that text that Lee read, Philippians 3, 4 to 6, Paul said this. I myself, he's referring to himself before conversion. Paul says, I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh. This rich young man has much confidence in the flesh. I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. <coughs> Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. That's what the young man was saying. All these I have kept. Those commandments that you just mentioned, Jesus, with regard to those, I am blameless. And then he asks another question at the end of verse 20. He says, all these I have kept, what do I still lack? So the very interesting thing here is that, that Jesus is so wise. He, he, he has set this man up, right? <laughs> because we've said that there's six commandments in that second table of the law for, for how you treat your neighbor how you love others. And Jesus only mentioned five of them because he knew the one that the man was breaking, right? Do you remember the one he left out? The, the 10th commandment. Je Jesus didn't mention that the first time. The 10th commandment is this. You shall not covet. You shall not covet. And so in verse 21, after this young man has said, all these I have kept, Jesus wheels out number 10. Look at verse 21. What do I still lack? Verse 21, Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So the young man wants to know, What can I do to have eternal life? And Jesus tells him, Sell all that you have. Give to the poor. Come follow me. You've got to keep commandment number 10 as well. And why did Jesus ask this young man to do this? Because he knew that this man was a covetous person. He knew that this young man loved his possession and his wealth. And Jesus did this to expose the futility of this young man's self-salvation project. The 10th commandment was the nail in the coffin for this rich young fellow who had great wealth. He had a craving for material things because wealth made him self-sufficient. His wealth meant that he did not have to rely on anybody for anything. His wealth enabled him to live under the proud illusion that he could rely entirely upon his own resources. And evidently, this illusion of self-sufficiency created by wealth had transferred over into the spiritual realm for this young man as well. And that's why Jesus says this to his disciples. Look at verse 24 of Matthew 19. Matthew 19, 24. He says, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. In other words, it is easier to put a camel through the eye of a needle than for a proud, self-sufficient person, that pride and self-sufficiency being generated by wealth, to enter the kingdom of God. It's as hard to get a camel through the eye of a needle as it is for a self-sufficient person who has wealth to admit, I am spiritually bankrupt and I have nothing and I need to depend on Christ alone for eternal life. So it's not money that keeps a person out of heaven. It's that pride, that spirit of self-sufficiency which keeps people out of heaven and it is more than possible to have such a spirit, even if you don't have a whole lot of money. Now, by human standards, uh, this young man was doing quite well, wasn't he? He had kept five out of the six commandments that Jesus laid out there for him. That, I don't know, that's what, 83% or something? I, I wish I could keep God's commandments 83% of the time. Listen to what James chapter 2 and verse 10 says about this. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point, has become guilty of all of it. In other words, if you are going to rely on your own merits for a right standing with God in any shape, form, or fashion, you had better keep all of it or you're toast, okay? 
That is what James is saying in James 2.10. He's saying this. If you want to be saved through your own merits, it is an all or nothing proposition. God is not grading on a curve because his holy character will not permit or allow him to grade on a curve. Now, the average American churchgoer, and there are people sitting here this morning who believe this. The average American churchgoer believe that salvation is a mixture of God's grace and what I do. Most churchgoers conceive of Jesus and of grace as God through Christ making up for what I lack. This young man asked Jesus, what do I still lack? And Jesus' response was meant to show this young man, my friend, you lack everything. You lack absolutely everything because you're not perfect. He said, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess, give it to the poor, come follow me. So God has two categories for human beings, law keepers and lawbreakers. Those are the only two categories that people fall into. The perfect people are law keepers. And anyone who has sinned is a lawbreaker. Now Jesus, obviously, is the only man in the one category. And all the rest of us are in that other category of lawbreakers. Christ is the only perfect man who ever lived. And so if you're not relying 100% on the merits of Christ for right standing with God today, let me say to you that you lack absolutely everything for getting to heaven. If I gave you a, a cup of water to drink this morning, and I said, here's this water, I ran it through a Brita filtration pitcher, it is 99% pure, pure. I only put in one drop of E. coli. Would you drink this water? <laughs> well, of course you wouldn't. Why not? Well, you, you just couldn't bring yourself to do it. And in the same way, God, because he is holy, cannot bring himself to receive sinners into his presence who are anything less than perfectly righteous. And so when I, when I say to people, you will not, escape the wrath of God. You will not make it to heaven unless you are perfectly righteous. Most people think that that's something discouraging or, or that that's somehow bad news. Listen, that is the most encouraging news that you have ever heard today. It is gloriously good news that only perfectly righteous people can make it to heaven. Why? Because if it were true that good people can go to heaven, then the other 50% of us would have no chance. There would be at least 50% of the population, the worst half, that would have no chance of being saved. But the fact that God offers to save us based on the merits of his sinless son means that there is hope for every man and every woman, not just the good ones. What a happy fact it is that the weakest and the poorest and the most ignorant and the most sinful, the vilest people, people who have made an absolute wreck of their lives, even the bad people can be saved by turning to Christ in repentance and faith. What a happy thing to know that God justifies the ungodly. When you think about it in that fashion, our popular culture gospel, good people go to heaven, is not such good news anymore. Is it? In Luke 18, Jesus told the parable about how the gospel is good news even for bad people. <laughs> Luke 18, verse 9 through 14. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. In other words, people who believed that they themselves were good people. Verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. A tax collector is a bad man. Okay, The worst of the worst in Jesus' day. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God... I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. In other words, God, I thank you that I am such an awesome person. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, 
God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. In other words, everyone who casts himself on the mercy of God in Christ will be saved, even tax collectors, even the worst of the worst. <coughs> so the Pharisee was impressed by his own goodness. The tax collector knew he had none, and so he looked away from himself up to God for mercy and grace, and he was Justified, He was declared righteous. A theologian named Michael Horton says this. He says, quote, A moralistic religion of self-salvation is our default setting as fallen creatures. If we are not explicitly and regularly taught out of it, we will always turn the message of God's rescue operation into a message of self-help. The gospel is a message that calls us to look outside ourselves for something that we don't have. The gospel is a message that calls us to look away from ourselves and to Christ for what it takes to be right with God. It's the announcement the gospel is that God has provided salvation through the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ for every sinner who will come to him empty-handed, empty-handed. Jesus lived the perfect life that you and I have not lived. And he died the death that we deserved. And his perfect goodness, his perfect righteousness is available to every single person who will humble themselves and like that tax collector say, God, have mercy on me, the sinner that I am. So what kind of person makes it to heaven? Number one, good people cannot make it to heaven. And secondly and finally, needy people can make it to heaven. <laughs> Needy people can make it to heaven. Look at verse 13 and 14. Then children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. So the arrangement of the material in the Gospels is anything but random. It's arranged in a certain order for a certain reason. And the reason that these three verses about the little children being brought to Jesus precedes the account of the rich young man coming up to Jesus is because the attentive reader is supposed to compare and contrast the children and the rich young man. The arrangement of this material is carefully calculated to show that proud, self-reliant people cannot be saved and that needy, humble, dependent people can be saved. Look at verse 14. Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is not here trying to say uh, that heaven's just full of little kids, though it may be or may not be. That's not his point. His point is that people that get into heaven are this kind of people. To such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Listen to Ma Matthew 18.3. Matthew 18, 3. Jesus says, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you turn and become like little children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, what are little children like then? If I have to become like a little child, tell me what a little child is like. Well, if you compare verse 13 and verse 16, you can see. Look at verse 13. It says, then little children were brought to him. Now compare that to verse 16. And behold, a man came up to him. See the difference? The rich man came up to Jesus in his own power and his own strength. How did the children get to Jesus? They, they were brought. They were weak. And they, they were carried to Jesus by others. And the fact that they were brought to Jesus is a physical picture of spiritual neediness and helplessness. And the simple point is this. Nobody walks into heaven on their own two feet. Did you hear me? Nobody walks into heaven on their own two feet. You'll be carried by Jesus or you will never get in. Amen. There's a beautiful illustration of this principle 
in 2 Samuel chapter 9. And in 2 Samuel chapter 9, David finally, after many years of running from King Saul, gets on the throne of Israel. Saul's dead. Saul's son, Jonathan, who was David's good friend, is now dead. And David has solidified the monarchy under his power. And he says in 2 Samuel chapter 9, he says, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? So Jonathan and David were good friends, and he wanted to show kindness to someone from Jonathan's family for Jonathan's sake. And one of David's servants replies there in 2 Samuel chapter 9, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. And this son's name was Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. And David sent and brought Jonathan's son Mephibosheth to Jerusalem and gave him all that had belonged to his grandfather, King Saul. And 2 Samuel 9, 13 says this. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both feet. And so this account of Mephibosheth goes to pain to show that he was a cripple. He was lame in both feet. What's the point of this lame man eating at the king's table? The point is this. In order to eat at the king's table in the age to come, you have to be brought there Amen. as a spiritual invalid. You've got to be brought there like a little child. You've got to be carried there like Mephibosheth was. You've got to be entirely dependent on the merits of Jesus. So let me ask you this question today. From a spiritual standpoint, how do you view your, your own self? Do you view yourself as a lame beggar who's been brought to the king's table by the grace and the mercy of Jesus? Or do you view yourself as someone who's able to stand before the king on your own two feet? Are you like the little children who were humbly brought to Jesus? Or are you like this rich young man who came up to Jesus? Look at verse 13 again. Verse 13 says, Little children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. What did the little children come for? They came to receive something. What did the rich young man come for? He came to give God something. What can I do for God? What can I do to have eternal life? Quite the contrast. You see, the gospel is not a help wanted sign. God is not looking for people to work for him. God is looking for people who've been humbled by their own sin. People who are ready to come to Jesus and rely on Christ alone as their bread of life. That's what Christ is looking for. And so... This self-salvation project that the rich young man was involved in, it takes many different forms. For the rich young man in Matthew 19, it took the form of earning salvation through a commitment to personal holiness. I'll be holy enough to get there on my own merit. That's kind of the religious track of self-salvation. But there's also the, the non-religious track, the, the secular track. A, a woman like Rosaria Butterfield describes that secular self-salvation track this way. She says this. Uh, she, she, she was um, a college professor who was a lesbian, and then she was saved, and this is what she says about herself. She says, quote, As a professor of English and women's studies, on the track to becoming a tenured radical, I cared about morality, justice, and compassion. My partner and I shared many vital interests, AIDS activism, children's health and literacy, Golden Retriever Rescue, and our Unitarian Universalist Church, to name a few. Along the way, an unexpected friendship developed with a Presbyterian pastor and his wife. I began to read the Bible voraciously. Then, one ordinary day, I came to Jesus, open-handed and naked. Jesus triumphed. I was a broken mess. And then there are the self-salvation uh, people who are a mixture of the religious and the non-religious. That's, that's most likely who I'm talking to today if you're not a Christian, a mixture. And these are people who believe that they're okay with God because they're politically conservative. And they stand on all the, the, they stand on the right side of all the major moral issues like homosexuality, abortion, transgenderism, etc. And they give mental assent to the gospel. 
But these people have never been brought to a place of genuine humility, brokenness, and despair over their own life. These are the kind of people that believe Jesus helps them get to heaven, but they've never really looked away from their self entirely and begun to rely exclusively on Christ alone for salvation. In John 3, the Lord Jesus had an enlightening conversation with just such a person, a good person, a real patriot, a real political conservative, a person who was really interested in being on the right side of all the moral issues. His name was Nicodemus. He told Nicodemus this in John 3, 14 to 15. He said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. In other words, Jesus told Nicodemus, I, I know you're a good guy. <laughs> At least in your own mind you are. Do you remember in the Old Testament when, when, when our forefathers were, were lost in the desert and they started griping and grumbling about what they had to eat and how bad things were? And God got angry with them and he sent a bunch of poisonous snakes into the camp and the poisonous snakes bit the people and they were dying and God said to Moses, uh, go get a bronze pole and make an image of a bronze serpent and put it on the end of that bronze pole and walk through the camp and everybody that's been bitten by the poisonous snake that looks at it will live. <coughs> Jesus said, Nicodemus, I know you're a quote-unquote good person, but you're going to have to stop looking away from yourself, or stop looking to yourself, and you're going to have to look away from, from yourself. You're going to have to look to me. I'm going to be lifted up on a cross. And if you'll look away from your own righteousness, says Nicodemus, and look to me in faith as your crucified, sin-bearing king, I'll save you. Just as that bronze serpent saved every person who looked to it in faith. Let me ask you this. Are you a Christian who is looking to Christ alone or are you just another good person who happens to attend church? Have you come to the point in your spiritual journey where you're forever done with looking inside yourself for something that would merit God's favor? You want to know something that is hard for people to understand? Grace. There is nothing harder to get into the fallen sinner's big skull than grace. Have you really begun to look away from yourself to Christ alone for the perfect righteousness that can save you? So what kind of person makes it to heaven? Not those who think they're good, not those who come on their own two feet, but those who come like a little child. Not asking, what can I do to have eternal life? But what has Christ done for me that I might inherit it as a gift? Let's pray. <clears throat> Our Father, we thank you for your word that communicates deep, profound, abiding, life-saving truth to us. And Lord, we like to think that we know. And we like to think that our own reasoning and our own understanding about how we can be right with you and how to get to heaven and what it means to be a Christian is more authoritative than your revealed word through your apostles. Please forgive us for that. Help us to have a worldview, to have a view of salvation that comes from the scriptures alone. And Lord, I pray for the folks here who are still in some measure impressed with their own self. They would never say that, but they've never been brought to a place of despair over their own sin. Yes, they would admit, I'm a sinner, but never have they said in earnestness from the heart what that tax collector said, God have mercy on me, the sinner that I am. And so we pray, Lord, that you would take out a heart of stone and give a heart of flesh, and that we would be able to have joy and knowing that everything that it takes to stand before a holy God on the last day and to be received by him as dearly loved children is found through Jesus Christ. Thank you that he has taken our sin away, that he is our righteousness. Teach us how to believe these things. Make us strong in the faith, Lord, and make us strong in grace. Amen. I'm going to let Ivy play a couple of verses. You go to the Lord in prayer and prepare your heart for communion. <laughs>
we come to receive these elements that are emblematic of what Christ has done to save sinners. Remember that the Lord's table is for baptized believers in Jesus Christ who rested all their hope on the merits of Jesus. Not most of their hope or some of their hope, but all their hope on the merits of Jesus. If you're not yet a baptized believer, you should refrain from partaking until you come to faith in Christ. So this is a holy meal. Don't come down here flippantly as someone who's not converted and is not a Christian and does not love and trust Jesus and take these elements because Scripture says if you take them in the wrong way, you eat and drink judgment to yourselves. The Lord's table is for saved sinners, which is what we all are. But if you are living in some kind of unrepentant sin, we ask that you would make that right with the Lord before you partake of the elements. When you're ready, you may come. Gospel of Matthew chapter 26, we read these words. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. this one in. It is defective. <laughs> ah, that, that one has less than a gallon of super glue on it, so we're going to be able to get that one off. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them to say, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand and sing, Not in Me.
Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14 says this. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in the grace of Christ. Thank you.